It's in Jesus' name, it's so good to be here and uh, starting another month with a fresh topic on prayer. Last one month we were speaking about giving and uh, we're going to start uh, a topic on prayer and I know it's uh, difficult than giving sometimes. <laughs> prayer is a very important uh, aspect of our lives and so uh, I pray and uh, hope that as we listen to the word, each one of our prayer life will be increased, we will uh, get closer to God, we will develop a good relationship with the Lord and continually pray and intercede for us, for others, for the church. So this uh, evening, let us turn our Bibles to Matthew chapter 26, 36 to 46. Matthew chapter 26, 36 to 46. Can I have someone read for us louder and clear, louder, so that everyone can join and listen? Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and, two son and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Could you men not keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping, because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away one, once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour is near, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. May God bless the reading of the Word of God. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Brother Deepak, for reading the Word with us. Um, well, uh, once there was an atheist who never believed in God, who never trusted in God, no matter uh, how many times he heard about God and the Word and how God is good, he never trusted God, he never looked to God, he never came to church. Finally, one day, uh, he likes uh, hunting and hunting, so he just went to a forest and as he was hunting, as uh, he was hunting, there was a wild boar who was a bear which was actually after him. And so he began to run for his life. And he, as he was running, 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 uh, all of a sudden he fell into a trap, uh, a ditch, and uh, he was a problem now. The wild bear was waiting at the top, looking at him. He was looking at the bear. And then finally, out of his anxiety, out of his fear, he began to cry out saying, God, please help me, God, please help me. And that was the moment he could remember that he needs God's help. And he was just crying and shouting and praying and uh, fervently asking God. At that time, you know, even uh, uh, as, uh, as this man was saying, God help me, the bear also knelt down and said, God, I am asking, I have prayed for the first time to give me food. And I know it will not be. <laughs> and you answer my prayer. <laughs> Well, uh, I think uh, we may have heard about prayer many a times. Last time I preached about prayer. Last week we had T.B. Thomas who was preaching about prayer in the Telugu service. And he started like this. He said that one thing that everyone can do and that is prayer. Every believer can do is prayer. No matter you're old or young or child, everyone can pray. And everyone can um, participate in prayer. He mentioned three important things, that God is not a partial God. He doesn't show 
partiality mm -hmm. and God is a God who is all powerful all knowing and uh, he's a God who knows all about us and he has all authority mm -hmm. so when you come to God in prayer we must understand that he is a God who knows everything about us all the details about us mm -hmm. Sometimes we come to prayer and we try to give God all the information. <laughs> oh, this is the way, this is the way I'm suffering, or this is the way it's happening. Or maybe we just direct God to help us in certain way. We we make plans, we pray and say, Lord, let this happen in this way, rather mm -hmm. than saying that let your will be done in our life. Secondly, he said, God is a God who has all authority. So we are coming to a God who knows everything about us. Mm -hmm. He knows everything about the situation happening around us. And secondly, he has all authority. He is an all-powerful God. And uh, thirdly, he said he is an all-powerful God. So we are coming to a God uh, who can help us, who can actually give answers to us. So we have to be mindful that we are coming to an almighty God, all-powerful God, all-knowing God. And knowing your, we come with humility so that we uh, pour our hearts before God knowing that God will answer our prayers. This uh, evening I want to uh, speak to us about the ministry of prayer, the ministry of prayer from the life of Jesus. So we are going to explore the ministry of prayer from the life of Jesus Christ. The passage I've chosen for today's devotion, uh, it says about the prayer of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. We know that Jesus was at the last hour of his life. But one thing he did was, he, he, uh, before he went to the cross, he decided to spend the time in prayer. So while Jesus was exceedingly sorrowful, deeply distressed, knowing his time has come to an end, and that he has to go to the cross, Jesus decided to do the best thing. So he, he calls all his disciples, and then he walks into the Garden of Gethsemane, and he is asking the disciples to watch and pray. But here we see that he, uh, after he left few disciples, he takes Peter, John, and James uh, if a little further, even asks them to stop and pray. And then Jesus goes alone and he, he begins to pray. But we know that Jesus comes back and sees them all uh, sleeping and they're tired, their eyes were heavy. And this happens thrice. So three times Jesus goes and asks them to pray. They just doze off to sleep. They're tired, they're lazy, they're like, uh, they're not able to pray, but Jesus comes, uh, comes uh, he goes a little further and he's praying with a heavy heart uh, and he's, he knows that his time has come to an end and uh, that he's going to go to the cross and endure the suffering and it's, it's a very, very hard thing for Jesus, but yet Jesus has decided to do the best thing. So what we can do, uh, learn from this passage, the first thing is that when we are in the hardest times of our life, when we are in the toughest times of our life, it is only God to whom we have to look up. Okay? We can look up to God. Jesus has set an example for us. Even when he was in that distress, when he knows that he is going to enter into a suffering, Jesus decided to do the best thing. So what is the best thing that each one of us can do when you are in trouble, when you are anxious, when you don't know anything to do, when uh, there are no answers, there are no people to help us, come to the Lord, seek His face, kneel down and pray, and definitely there will be an answer, and God will comfort us, He will give us the strength that is needed. Mm -hmm. What happened to Jesus was that God gave Him the strength to go to the cross, endure the cross, become victorious, even though Jesus died, He rose again on the third day. Mm -hmm. Well, I, as I was like uh, preparing this message, I, I just uh, remembered my college days, Bible college days. When we were in Bible college, we had a morning chapel at every day at 5 a.m. in the morning. So it's quite difficult. Right here in, uh, in Singapore, we have every Monday on Tuesday, uh, on uh, every Monday at 8, 8 a.m. So, but it's very, it's kind of hard sometimes to wake up in the morning. Now I was imagining uh, back in my Bible college when I have to wake up every single day at 5 a.m. in the morning. So the warden would come into each room and he would wake up some of the people because they were 
more than half of them were lazy, they were tired, they wanted to sleep more. So he would just, he has to come and literally lift up the blankets because they were all sleeping. Uh, then he would just go from room to room and when he goes to the next room, these people will go back to sleep. <laughs> some people who wakes up, uh, they would just go into the toilet, sit for some time, they will doze up to sleep. <laughs> and uh, when he takes a round, maybe there are 10 to 15 or 20 rooms he has to go. We were having like 400 to 500 college students. So he had to go and wake up everyone because some people would stay back. So, and then, uh, they would come into the chapel and uh, even uh, in the chapel people will just sit down and as the worship goes on they will be sleeping. <laughs> and some people would literally stay back after using the toilet, they will see okay the warden has left, they would go back to their room and they would again sleep. So that's what uh, was happening. So I think uh, this is uh, an important thing because in our life as Christians, you know, uh, we become tired and lazy and you know, uh, we... Uh, that we can see the disciples in a similar way. They were really, really tired. Their eyes were heavy, says the Bible. But Jesus was always alert. Jesus was always alert. Charles Stanley once said, We can be tired, very emotionally distraught, but after spending time alone with God, mm -hmm. we find that He injects into our bodies energy, power, and strength. You, know, you could be tired. You could be exhausted from all your work. You know, but still, the Bible, he tells us that when you spend time alone with God, you know, he injects power and strength and energy into our bodies. I know that many of you may have experienced it in your personal life mm -hmm. uh, uh, as you pray to God, as you seek his face. So I want to encourage all of us to keep doing that because we are really living in a very stressful environment. Environment. There are so many getting mentally ill and uh, anxious, you know, when I read about uh, all the things that's coming in the news and how people are mentally affected and how uh, uh, even uh, those who are in ministry, even Christians going through this mental stress because one thing we don't do is that we, take, we do not take that into prayer. We do not come into the presence of God. Even though we know that our God is a God who empowers us, even though we know that our God is a God who gives us strength, we must go and uh, uh, find time alone with God, spend time alone with God. So Jesus was trying to communicate this important aspect of prayer to the disciples, that when you pray, they will be empowered. And Jesus, we know that he, start, he was starting the day with prayer, he ends the day with prayer. Sometimes we see that Jesus prayed whole night. All that he was doing was praying whole night before he went into ministry, into villages and towns to preach. And uh, so for Jesus, prayer was a ministry. For Jesus, prayer was a ministry. The great American evangelist and revivalist D.L. Modi once said, I would rather be able to pray than be a great preacher. Jesus Christ never taught his disciples how to preach, but only how to pray. You know, Jesus, the disciples were with Jesus. And he, there is no, uh, there is no references or scriptures in the Bible saying that Jesus taught them how to preach. But one thing Jesus certainly did in Matthew chapter six, we see that Jesus taught them how to pray, mm -hmm. taught them how to look to God and how to pray. And so this is very important. So the greatest ministry one can have is the ministry of prayer. All of us can have, and it is free. God is giving to all of us. No matter you are a pastor, evangelist or uh, apostle or anywhere you are a believer God is giving us this ministry all of us can have this so we have to understand that prayer is the foundation and the important spiritual disciplines to practice in our lives as believers and ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ because all of us are called for this ministry we can all pray Maybe you, we, we cannot sing, we, can all, may, may not, we, we may not sing, be able to sing, but we can all pray. 1 Peter 2, 4 to 5 says, As you come to him, a living stone rejected by man, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves like living, like living stones are built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. 
Here the Bible compares a believer as a, as a, um, a holy priesthood. 1 Peter 2, 9 says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So here the scriptures are, are telling us that all of us are a royal priesthood. That means God has given us this ministry of prayer. In the Old Testament, only the Levites were the priests, and they were the ones who were actually ministering to people, coming in the presence of God, leading the people into worship and offering sacrifices. But in the New Testament, through the blood of Jesus, through the salvation that we have in Jesus Christ, we are all a royal priesthood. We are all called as the light of the world. We are all called as uh, we are all called as salt to this earth. So here, the Bible tells us that we are a royal priesthood. That means. Everyone can pray and everyone has to pray. Everyone can have this ministry and serve the Lord and serve the people and serve the purposes of God in our generation. How can we establish prayer as a ministry? There are so many biblical texts and examples that we can see. First, let's look at uh, what is ministry. The word uh, diakonia in Greek is a noun used 32 times in the New Testament and variously translated as ministry, service, relief, or support. Okay, the word diakonia in Greek. It says that it's a ministry, service, relief, or support. Another noun that corresponds to diakonia is diakonos, which most basically means servant, one who serves. That means through prayer, we actually support one another. We are supporting our feeble brothers and sisters, those who are weak, those who are actually growing in the Lord, those who are pre-believers yet to come to the Lord, those who have come new, those are spiritual babies. That means we offer, we also offer service unto God through this ministry of prayer. Uh, so it is, a, uh, it is something that we use to serve other people. We do it to minister God through our lives and uh, uh, the ministry of prayer. So friends, I want to encourage us that maybe you may not stand up here and lead worship. Maybe you may not stand up here and preach the word of God, but we can serve people through praying for people. Mm -hmm. You know, I really appreciate our group of sisters, those who are gathering every Sunday before the service. You are just praying and interceding. I was really touched to see you kneeling down today and praying. You know, it's such a wonderful ministry that you're doing in the background. And God is... Uh, God is so pleased with you and you know you are actually standing against the spiritual darkness uh, against the works of the evil one who is trying to stop the work of God you are doing spiritual warfare when you are praying so nothing is more powerful and profitable than the spiritual act this is the spiritual discipline which all of us can develop in our life which all of us can do every day every day of our life it's not just on Sunday but every day. Yesterday we were, I was having my uh, class on di Christian discipleship and I was, uh, I was doing a, uh, I was uh, talking about uh, this uh, concept of discipleship within the context of Indian churches where uh, the dis there is a lack of discipleship in many churches. So as I was speaking about the discipleship within the context of the church, you know, later the, uh, the professor who was teaching us said, Ratan, I appreciate whatever you said, but what I'd like to hear is that, you know, discipleship is not within the church itself, you know. You come to church on Sunday, but Monday to Saturday, you know, you are out in the world. All of you are out in the world. The believers are out in the world. Mm -hmm. How can you represent Jesus Christ? How can you be a disciple of Jesus Christ Monday to Saturday? And I really feel that this is very important. You're coming on Sunday for two to three hours, but you're going back into the world. You know, that is where uh, it tells you that you are a Christian. That is where you will be tested as a Christian. Mm -hmm. That is where your ministry is. When you are there in your schools, when you are attending your college, when you are going to your workplace, you know, that is where your real ministry is. That is where you have to prove yourself to be a Christian because nobody is watching you. You know, that is where you have to stand for Jesus Christ. So there is, therefore, as believers, we need to re-embrace the ministry of prayer. 
Maybe we may have become lazy, slack, and we may have neglected these important spiritual disciplines in our life. But I feel that this is very, very important. One of the analogies that uh, uh, people often use for prayer is about the oxygen that we take. You know, how many, how many, hours, uh, how many hours in a uh, day do we take oxygen? We take it 24-7, right? We take it 24-7. And you imagine one minute without oxygen, it's, it's, uh, it's like you're dead, as good as dead. And so in the same manner, for a Christian, I think prayer is so, so essential. It's like an oxygen. It's like you're breathing every moment, you know. Uh, so when you're traveling in the MRT, when you're like doing your dishes, cooking, or maybe you're working, you can always pray. There is no one who can stop you from praying. You know, because you're not verbally, maybe you verbally may not be saying it out, but you, you can pray in the spirit, you can pray in your heart, and nobody in the world can really, really stop you. So let's cultivate this ministry of prayer. Richard Baxter, uh, uh, he says, prayer must carry on our work as much as preaching. He preacheth not heartily to his people that will not pray for them. You know, when I stand here, I have to pray that God will speak to each one of you. You know, if I don't pray at home or may not prepare and I don't spend time, or if when Brother Deepak is leading the worship, whoever is preaching or leading the worship, if we are not spending time uh, in prayer and we come up here, nothing is going to be effective. But when you pray and come, you know, when people hear the word, they will be transformed. When the worship is led, people will enjoy and people will connect to God. So it is very important that we pray and we spend time. Martin Luther once said, to pray well is the better half of study. You know, I'm studying, many of them are studying, many of you may be studying the word. You know, better than preaching or better than like this study, he says that if you pray, that is actually the best thing. You know, the best thing is to do prayer. That means what he's saying is that prayer is essential as much as any other thing. And we got to come back to this, uh, this uh, spiritual discipline of praying. Now, Jesus is our greatest example. Jesus simply did not teach and said, okay, you practice or you pray. I'm not going to pray. I'm going to sit in my office and I'm going to prepare sermons. He didn't do that. But Jesus' life was full of prayers, and he always uh, prayed. He set an example to pray and intercede with his own life. He established the ministry of prayer through his daily discipline of prayer life. The Bible tells us in Hebrew 5, 7, In the days of his flesh, Jesus Christ offered up prayers and supplications. During the days of Jesus' uh, Jesus's life on earth, he offered up praise and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from the death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Mm -hmm. So Jesus was interceding. He was interceding for his disciples. He was interceding for the whole world. He was interceding for the church. And he was crying out to the Father. We also see that Jesus Christ prayed in the night. In, uh, in some instances, Continuing all night in prayer. Luke 6, 12 says, One of those days Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. He prayed the whole night. He spent the whole night. And imagine after praying the whole night, he had that energy, he had that anointing, he had that power and authority. When he went into those villages and towns, those uh, people who were demon-possessed began to tremble at his presence. When he preached the word, multitudes came. You know, while they touched the garments of Jesus, people were healed. You know, because Jesus spent the whole night in prayer. Because he was drawing the strength from the Father. He was drawing the authority and the power from the Father. You know, even as Christians, as we live out, as we live in this world, we need the power we need God's anointing. We need God's strength in our life. You know, when you go out into the world, God will help you to stand strong so that people's lives will be touched. You know, God wants to use all of us as light and salt. So when you enter into your workplaces, anywhere you go, we need to touch people's lives through our prayers. Jesus Christ also rose very early in the morning, a great while before uh, the day to pray. 
Mark 135 says that he rose up early in the morning. Sometimes he prayed the whole night, sometimes he woke up early in the morning. And it is so apparent from this that Jesus spent his time with God. He had a communion with God and he, he prepared himself for the ministry ahead. Luke 3, 21 to 22 says that Jesus Christ prayed before his baptism with the Holy Spirit and entrance upon his public ministry before entering upon an evangelistic tour, before choosing the 12 disciples, before announcing to the 12 his approaching death, before important steps in his life, he prayed for important events of life by special <coughs> sessions of prayer. So Jesus is teaching us that for everything we got to pray. Maybe it's a minor thing, it's a major thing. We got to pray and Jesus practiced it in his life. And Jesus teach, is teaching us from his own life that we also can do this and be effective in our life. When Jesus Christ prayed after the great achievements and important uh, crisis of his life, Christ of his life, Matthew 14, 23 says, And after he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. John 6, 15 says, Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountainside by himself. So when the important things in his life came, when there was a time when he has to make decisions, he was praying. So in your life, when there is a time when you have to make important decisions, you know, we can come before God and ask God for his wisdom and his leading. And God will certainly lead us and give us victory. Even after his great achievements, uh, Christ prayed in order to recover strength. In Mark 5.30 we see, At once Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crown and asked, Who touched my clothes? Here we see that Jesus, you know, he, he was constantly praying. And because of his prayer life, you know, people even though when they were touching him, it, uh, through his words they were healed and they were restored. Jesus Christ also prayed before he ate. We see in many instances, he lifted up the food and he prayed. And this is the best thing all of us do in our lives. Best thing all of us pray uh, before the food, right? Many of us. Uh, when life was unusually busy, Jesus Christ withdrew in a solitary place to pray. He always had his time alone, alone with God. So, apart from the Sunday, we also... I want to encourage us to pray as a family and also pray individually, alone. You know, the small children here, they can pray. The young people here, they can pray. You lose nothing by praying, right? You lose nothing by praying. But when you pray, you draw God's strength. When you pray, you, are, uh, you receive God's authority. When you pray, God will help you to take important decisions in your life. Jesus, in the Lord's Prayer, said, lead us not into temptations. You know, this is an important prayer. All of us, many young people can pray that God will not lead us into temptation, but that he will make a way for us mm -hmm. so that, uh, uh, that, that we may uh, see that way and run into that way. Jesus Christ prayed when he was weary. Mm -hmm. Mark 6, 31, 33 to 35, 46 says that when Jesus was weary and tired, he came before God and prayed. Many of us, we are tired easily, we are exhausted in our life, you know, we are mentally stressed out, we are physically stressed out, we have so many burdens and anxieties and sorrows in our life, you know, uh, so it is important that we come before God in prayer. So what Jesus is teaching us that for everything let us come before God in prayer. Jesus Christ prayed before his great temptations, before Jesus was tempted, he prayed. And he, he won the devil. devil. He, he was uh, victorious. He could defeat, the, defeat Satan. Jesus Christ prayed in the last moment of his life, as we read. Even at the last moment, even at the cross, when he was hanging, he said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. At the last moment, he said, Father, I commit my, uh, my life into your hands. And Jesus prayed the last prayer, and he died. So our Lord uh, Jesus Christ, apart from... Um, setting an example through his life to pray all the time in difficult times, in happiest, happiest times for ministry, uh, for his personal life. Jesus also taught his disciples how to pray. Mm -hmm. 
That means all of us, we have to take this very seriously. He also prayed the high priestly prayer for the disciples in John 17. He prayed and covered his disciples, the ministry that they're going to have, uh, the, the church that is going to be uh, uh, formed and that is going to impact the world. Jesus prayed in John 17. So what Jesus is teaching us from John 17 that we also need to cover our children, our young people, mm -hmm. our husbands, our wives in prayer. Every day, when you wake up in the morning, pray for them. Mm -hmm. When you go to sleep at night, pray for them. It is really, really important because we don't know what's happening. There are so many things happening in this world. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you pray, they're covered by the blood of Jesus. When you mm -hmm. and I pray, we are sealed by the Holy Spirit and we are safe into the, in the hands of God. The New Testament say that Jesus' ministry of prayer continues even after ascension to heaven. Romans 8.34 says that Jesus is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Even though Jesus, he prayed and set an example and he left, he left to heaven but he is there sitting at the right hand of Jesus and he's interceding for you and me. He is praying for us so that God will use us, that God will deliver us from all the problems. He's praying that we will be always connected to God. 1 John 2, 1, it says that Jesus is our advocate with the Father. Hebrews 7, 25, it says that Jesus always lives to intercede for us. Mm -hmm. He has a never-ending ministry of prayer. It's a ministry which is, uh, nothing is able to stop him. Even though he's in heaven, he's always remembering each one of us. So that we get the strength for the day to continue. In the Old Testament, we also see that the ministry of prayer, uh, prayer as a ministry. We, if you, uh, we, we can see that David was a king who had a busy schedule. He had to look, on, uh, look. Uh, he has to rule the entire, uh, entire country. But yet, the Bible tells us seven times daily he prayed and he sought the Lord. He mm -hmm. knelt down. He came into the presence of God. Mm -hmm. We know that David sinned, but he just came to God and asked for repentance. His life, the, uh, his life was punctuated with prayer. The psalms that you read, it's a psalm of prayers. Most of them are a psalm of prayers. Secondly, we also, we also can see Daniel in the Bible. He was also a ruler, you know. But still, Daniel, he prayed three times. He went into his room, opened the windows towards Jerusalem. He knelt down and he prayed. You know, he was in a good position. David was in a good position. He had all the armies, he had the wealth, he had authority. But these people took time to come and pray. Because even for them, even for them, prayer was so necessary. Because they were also going through a lot of stress in their life. And all that they could do is to come before God and look to God. We see in the Bible, uh, various people... Even Elijah, and we see uh, Elijah, you know, he survived the famine. And then he survived King Ahab and Queen Jezebel's wrath to fervent prayers. He always prayed. All that Elijah was doing in the wilderness, he went and he was spending uh, in prayer day and night. And God would send the bread and the meat for him to uh, just pray. How wonderful it is uh, for this, this prophet. They just had to pray and God was sending the bread and the meat. Mm -hmm. But... They took this very, very seriously. They know that they are standing in the gap and praying for them, interceding for them. They are standing as a wall between the enemy, enemy territory, so that the enemy will not intrude and uh, you know uh, disturb and destroy the people of God. And Elijah did that. He was standing as a rock. He was uh, through his prayer. He built a wall so that you know the people of Israel will be blessed. We also know Jeremiah. Jeremiah was, a, was named as a weeping prophet. He was interceding, he was weeping, and he was interceding for the people of Israel. Because he knew, he knows that, he knew that only through prayer, you know, people will come back to the Lord. Only through prayer, he can actually uh, minister to the people. Because they were not listening to his words. They were not listening to his prophecies. 
And we see many more hidden characters in the Old Testament who had a ministry of prayer. Mm -hmm. All through the Old Testament we see, all through the New Testament we see. The early church was formed by prayer. As they were in the upper room, they were praying uh, and for 40 days. And uh, we see that <clears throat> as they were gathered and prayed, the power of God came in the midst of them. The Holy Spirit came in the midst of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. They received the power and the early church began to spread all over the world because they started with prayer. They started with prayer and they continued to pray. The Bible tells us that they, they did not stop to pray. Every day they gathered. Every day they had fellowship. Every day they broke the bread and they were praying and as, as a result of that, even though there was persecution, even though there was hardship, even though they lacked so many things, they were beaten, persecuted, they were uh, beaten to death, crucified, but yet they did not stop to pray. While Peter was in the prison, you know what the church did was, the church fervently prayed. They were united in the spirit, in the heart, and they began to pray. And as they began to pray, God began to break the, um, uh, break the prison cell and uh, he brought Peter out of the prison. There's a power in prayer when you pray. In the New Testament, we also see, uh, apart from Jesus and the early church, we see Anna the prophetess in Luke 2, 36 to 38. She was a widow. Uh, her husband died after five years of marriage, but she continued in prayer even before Jesus was born. And she had the privilege, awesome and wonderful privilege, to see Jesus face to face, and she began to praise and uh, praise God. And she did an important thing in preparation for the birth of Jesus. She was having the ministry of prayer and intercession. Paul calls his friend Epaphras in Colossians 4, 7 to 14, as a man who was always praying, who was always interceding. We need some people in the church like that who can pray, who can, uh, who can intercede so that, so that uh, the ministry uh, will continue, the gospel will spread. James, uh, the disciple of Jesus, was nicknamed Camel Knees for his fervent prayer life. They say that history says that he would always kneel down and pray, that his knees became like camel's knees, hard because he was kneeling down and praying. He didn't have those carpets in, back in those days. Mm -hmm. You can, and may not have these tiles and stuff like that, but they may be like kneeling down in this hard ground and praying. You know, interceding. Uh, so James was nicknamed. So the ministry of prayer is seen all through the Old Testament and also in the New Testament. And Jesus set an example. Now, what are the marks of the prayer ministry? Marks of prayer ministry. Number one, prayer ministry is an elevated ministry. Prayer ministry is an elevated ministry. In Acts chapter 6, verse 4, 2 Thessalonians 1, 11, we see that it says that the apostles gave priority to the ministry of prayer. They said, okay, you guys serve, you guys do take care of the food ministry, the tea ministry, and the hospitality, and uh, the logistics, but we are going to set aside to pray, because it is very, very important, and I appreciate the sisters for taking that time, because, you know, if everybody, the pastor, the senior pastor is busy with the tea ministry, the assistant pastor <laughs> is busy with the tea ministry, who is going to pray? And you are praying, and it's really, really important. You know, sometimes we will be like caught in the events, programs, and we can forget praying, because this is very important. So it's an elevated ministry, it's a reciprocal ministry. The Corinthian ministry of giving was written by the recipients ministry in the form of, in, the, in prayer for them. You know, they gave, the Corinthian church gave funds and the apostles prayed for them. The church prayed for these people. So it's a reciprocal ministry. And thirdly, it's a supportive ministry. Prayer is a supportive ministry. Supporting God's word through prayer. You may not be able to give, but you can pray. You know, you may not be able to go and uh, be a missionary or preach the gospel, but regularly and earnestly you can pray. You lose nothing. You know, but you gain everything through prayer. So those who pray for those who work are the helpers together. You know, you are a part of the kingdom of God. You are a part of the gospel in the spreading of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Romans 15.30, 2 Corinthians 1.11 tells us 
that is a ministry or it's a supportive ministry. Fourthly, a prayer ministry is a majority ministry. Mm -hmm. Not many are called to be teachers, says the Bible, but all brethren are called to pray. Even the aged widow says 1 Thessalonians 5, 25, 2 Thessalonians 3, 1, 1 Timothy 5, 5 to 9. I'll send this PowerPoint so that you can uh, do a study by yourself. So all of us can pray. The children can pray. The widows can pray. And uh, uh, different ones can pray. And you can stand uh, strong behind us as we preach the gospel, as we reach out. We know it's very, very important. Then thirdly and finally, the need for a strong prayer ministry. There is a need for a strong prayer ministry. Firstly, God needed the ministry of Jesus. We know that Jesus came into the world to die for us, to give us salvation, to provide a way for us to connect back to the Father. And that is very important. Secondly, God needs the ministry of preachers. He needs the apostles, the preachers, the evangelists to go and preach the gospel. He needs the God's plan of salvation, you know, uh, that is needed. But undergirding all these ministries, God needs the prayer of the saints. Mm -hmm. When the yeah. saints prayed, the gospel began to spread. When the church, early church prayed, the gospel began to spread and people began to come to the Lord. And they were saved in hundreds and thousands. You know, God was doing awesome and powerful miracles because they were the only thing they could do is pray. They didn't have the Bible, you know. They didn't have Bible in those days, but they fervently and earnestly prayed. The Bible tells us these guys who were tax collectors, who were fishermen, who were common people, illiterate people, you know, they turned the world upside down. It's because they prayed. You know, they prayed. That's why he said more, uh, more prayer, more power, less prayer, Less power, no prayer, no power. You know? I think it was Billy Graham who said, a man who, who spends his time on the knees, he can stand before any man. You know? If you and I are a man and a woman, a young man, a child who is praying every day, you can stand before anyone. No matter what temptation comes, no matter who is, who are uh, the giants you face in your life, Everyone will bow down to you. God will give you victory because you are praying. Let me close this by uh, uh, sharing this powerful story of a true, uh, true story of a young man. It says the power of personal devotion and private prayer life. In the, night, in the 80, 1880s, a young man who was an earnest Christian found employment in a pawn shop. Although he disliked the work, he did it faithfully as unto the Lord until a more desirable opportunity opened for him. To prepare himself for a life of Christian service, he wrote on a scrap of paper the following resolutions. I do promise God that I will rise early every morning to have a few minutes, not less than five, in private prayer. I will endeavor to conduct myself as a humble, meek, jealous follower of Jesus. And by serious witness, and warning, I will try to lead others to think of the needs of their Im immortal souls. I hereby vow to read no less than four chapters in God's Word every day. I will cultivate a spirit of self-denial and will yield myself a prisoner of love to the Redeemer of the world. That young man was William Booth, who later led thousands to Christ and founded the Salvation Army. You know, when you earnestly pray and you take an important decision in your life to have these spiritual dis disciplines cultivated in our life. You know, these disciplines should become a habitat where you are dwelling. Prayer should become a habitat where you are always there. You are always there. Like in your house, you are always there in your house. That's the best comfort zone you have. In the same way, prayer should become a habitat. Because when, when you go out, that means you are there always in the spirit of prayer. Jesus said, you are the church. You know, Jesus said, you are the church. And so when you go out to the marketplace, when you go out to the workplace, you are taking the church. Church is not in the four walls 
of the building, but church is, you are the church, I am the church, we are the church. So when you step out, that means the, you, are, you are actually carrying the light of Jesus. You are being the salt in the world uh, to the people who are dying and to the people who are desperate and need Jesus and his Savior. And so may the Lord bless each one of us. I want to read this one thing and then I will... Uh, and here, E.M. Bounds, who is actually a good author about prayer, he said, What the church needs today is not more missionary or better, not new organizations or more noble methods, but men whom the Holy Ghost can use, men of prayer, men mighty in prayer. That's what God is looking at. He doesn't need the fancy buildings and all technology and lightings and you know, the smoke uh, on the dais, you know, you saw the Asbury revival, you know, that, is, that revival is spreading so fast in different colleges and universities because they have committed humbly in prayer. They were just praying day and night. There were no music, drums, or these lights and smoke, but they were humbly, you know, surrendering themselves to God. And they were men mighty in prayer and the revival is spreading. And God can cause that to happen in our life. Amen. It begins in our heart, in our life. And that can spread to the nook and corner of the world to you and me. Shall we bow our heads in prayer? Friends, the greatest battle today we face is busyness. Mm -hmm. We are busy with our assignments. We are busy with our gadgets. We are busy with our daily schedules. This busyness becomes a stumbling block mm -hmm. from our daily discipline of prayer and personal devotion. Can we surrender our lives to Jesus? And thank Him for setting an example for us while He was on this earth, always praying. Also when He is in heaven, He is sitting at the right hand of the Father and He is interceding for you and me. And He has given us that ministry of prayer. He has called us through the sacrifice of Jesus, we are all, we are all part of the kingdom of God now. And he's calling us a royal priesthood, a holy nation. And God is lifting you up and me and giving you that assignment to stand up before men. To the people who are in need, to the people who are dying, to the people who are in darkness, to the people who needs the salvation, who needs the savior, you can go and stand as a strong witness. You can be in the comfort of your home and pray and intercede for these people dying in darkness. And that's what Jesus is asking us to do today. Can we rededicate, re uh, commit our lives and say, Lord, I want to commit, I want to commit myself to pray every day, all the time, O oh Lord. When I'm traveling in the MRT, when I have this time, when all the people are looking at their mobiles, playing games and chatting and looking at the WhatsApp and Facebook and Instagram, I am going to pray silent prayers. Amen. When I am getting breaks in between my uh, workplace or my workplace, I'm going to spend, I'm going to do a, a prayer of a silent prayer for my school and for my uh, people around, my colleagues, my, oh Lord, I'm going to pray for everyone. I'm going to pray for my family. I'm going to pray for myself. When I'm cooking, washing dishes, when I'm doing the laundry, when I'm like uh, arranging the house, I'm going to pray, Lord. I'm going to pray all the time. When I'm taking an evening walk and when I'm exercising, I'm going to pray, Lord. Because I know that through prayer, I can have communion with you. Because through prayer, I can, I can come before you, oh Lord. I can draw the strength to move forward. I, I need your strength, oh Lord. I need the power. I need the, the leading of the Holy Spirit. Friends, the Bible tells us when you are weak, even though when you cannot pray, the Holy Spirit will pray on behalf of you. But we got to surrender ourselves to the Holy Spirit and say, Lord, I am weak and I need your strength. I need your help, O oh God. Father, we just thank you for this wonderful time. Thank you for your word about prayer. Thank you for teaching us in your word. That we got to pray, Lord, and always pray. And you taught your disciples how to pray. Help us, Lord, to cultivate this discipline, this spiritual discipline to pray. And to, and to Lord, be connected to you more and more. Bless all of us. And uh, 
We just give you all the glory in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.